Hello, Chocophiles. My name is Clay Gordon. Welcome to the Chocolate Wire interview with David Greenwood Hay from the UK. David, welcome. Thank you very much. Well, hi, Clay. We're glad to have you here. Uh, just before we came on, um, started the interview, I asked you what the FIH after your name was. I spend so much time working with people in South America that, you know, they, or in Mexico, they often have four or five different names. And so I don't know what is an honorific and what is part of the name. So what is the, yeah. uh, the David Greenwood, hey, I mean, so I'm going, well, I don't, I don't recognize that at all. What's, what's, what's going on there? I, I'm a fellow of the Institute of Hospitality. So it's an organization for hospitality managers uh, and it's uh, an international organization Right. And you explained to me that you have a particular uh, uh, mission that you're working with the your fellow hospital members of the hospitality community. Yeah, I'm trying to get hotels to think more ethically about what they do, because hotels are big consumers of stuff and big employers of people on low wages. So there's a, a very small hotel chain here in the UK called Ethical Hotels. And I often will go talk to them to make sure they're being ethical and make suggestions. And particularly in chocolate, because most hotels don't mention the name of the chocolate they're using. So it has no cr credentials. It has no ethical bound. And they say, well, nobody knows, nobody cares or nobody understands. If it's in a mousse, that's OK. Uh, and I'm trying to say, well, actually, no, it's not. And maybe you could... Uh, make more on your menu by using uh, origin beans and ethically sourced beans. You're talking about locally produced and reducing food miles. Well, you can't reduce the miles on the chocolate bar, really. Uh, but you can say you, you've ethically sourced and you've made sure that what you've done has made a difference. Uh, and once what? you can tell them that, they... So what is the what are the uh, barriers to... Um, these um, hospitality chains not wanting to do this. I mean, you know, it seems to me, you know, well, the, the first surprising. one is, uh, are, the, are the suppliers. So if you were to go to the major food service wholesalers, so in the States, if you went to Cisco and tried to see how much uh, ethical chocolate they were stocking, you'll find very little uh, because they will tell you there's no demand for it. If you then go to a hotel chain and ask why they don't buy it, because they will tell you it's a good idea. They'll tell you because they can't get it from their supplier. And you go round in this circular argument, uh, which is a similar one that the retailers try to use also. Uh, so you've got to try. Uh, when I worked for Divine Chocolate, I looked after the hotel chains. And it was my job to get airlines, travel and hospitality to take chocolate. And I managed to get listings in three of... I got it into Aramark... I got it also into Compass Group and into Sodexo. And they then went to their wholesalers and said, you must stock this product for us. Uh, but I had to start with the operators who were big enough and then come back the other way. So in the United States, we have, for the major hospitality chains, we have these things that are known as buying groups. So one of them is yeah. called a Vendra. And a hotel chain, um, individual properties might have quotas, you know, 80% of all of your purchases must be made through this buying group or that buying group. Mm -hmm. And as a yeah. vendor, if you're not listed with the buying group, I mean, uh, in this case, a pastry chef in their kitchen would say, okay, I have, you know, 2% of what it is that I spend every week, I can spend someplace else. And am I going to spend it on this chocolate or am I going to spend it on that product? Similar kind of thing going on yeah. in the UK? Absolutely. Yeah, very much so. And certainly with the contract caterers. So I used to specialise in going straight to the groups. So I would talk to the buying groups and try and get listings there. I tried to do it differently to the other chocolate, because Barry Calibo do that. So the big guys have specialists in that field. Uh, I almost took a job doing that for them. Uh, and they would have country managers with huge budgets that would take them to Ghana, that would take them to Cote d'Ivoire, show them their wonderful work, uh, wine and dine them, give them a good, a good time and bring them back with a suntan and some, and some gifts. Uh, 
as a worker for Divine, we didn't have that luxury. <laughs> Occasionally, I, I took customers, but it was usually journalists I would take uh, to try and make sure our story was told uh, further and wider. Uh, but where I would go and I decided to become a chocolate. I was a chef and then went selling food for major corporations. And I've worked for Unilever. I've worked for Chupa Chups. I've worked for Young's Bluecrest uh, and Campbell's US, uh, the soup company. So I was familiar with those methods and ways, but didn't have a budget to carry out those methods and ways. So I had to find something different. So I said, OK. Because I can cook, I'm going to be the chocolatier. And when I went to see my customers, I would take chocolate with me always and I would make them taste it and I would take them through the process. Uh, and again, it was stolen from your book. Uh, and I used the, the sensory tasting. I do look, touch, smell, taste uh, in that order. And I've developed a whole system around that uh, to, to take to people and whether it's wine or spirits or chocolate, I'm doing exactly the same. And Tesco's then said, would you train our buyers? Because I thought my first buyer at Tesco's didn't eat chocolate, so wouldn't taste the products I brought in. And I said, will you bring somebody to me that will taste them, please? He said, no, they won't sell. I said, how do you know? Because I do, I'm a buyer. And I said, but you've not tasted them. They might be the best chocolate in the world. I said, if they're not, that's okay but taste them and tell me. And she said, no, I don't eat chocolate. So I said, bring your boss, please. She, she looked, you can't do that. No, I want to see your boss. And I'm not going until your boss comes to talk to me. I can, I'm, a, I'm representing 80,000 cocoa farmers. I can't go away without having somebody taste the chocolate that we've worked really hard to produce. And her boss came over and said, I understand you're being difficult. And I said, yeah, I am. <laughs> I, and I said, would you taste this? And he said, yeah, okay. And he tasted it, and he said, that's really good. He listed two products and said, but I need them in three weeks. And Weinrich, who make divine products in Germany, were absolutely fantastic. They turned the product around in three weeks, and we'd got two products on the shelf. Uh, and all of a sudden, uh, we'd, we'd started with Tesco's again. So it was really good. And he then said, come back in and train some of my other buyers how to taste using that method. And I've done that with a couple of supermarket groups now. And I do it quite regularly at festivals and food festivals and things uh, and beer festivals. So I like beer. Have you? Absolutely. <laughs> have you have you ever run into another situation where you had a buyer who was responsible for the chocolate department who just refused to eat the chocolate? Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's happened frequently. Yeah, they, they they're used to seeing chocolate all day, so they get a little blasé that you can't tell me anything about chocolate. I do this all the time, uh, so I'll have a look and say no, that does. So I insisted when I worked for Unilever, part of their uh, formulaic sales training was you had to live sample. So from a very young age as a salesman. It was just in my in my DNA from that day because it was drilled into you. So, you know, every time I meet somebody, I take chocolate. You know, you, you'll seldom meet me. In fact, the, the couple of times we met in London, I'd got something for you. Uh, I think last time I gave you the, the tasting sticks mould. But this, I, I think it's rubbish to meet a chocolate person that doesn't have any chocolate because they're not really a chocolate person, are they? They're just a person. <laughs> so well, I always <laughs> maybe they're a chocolate the chocolate person who's down on their luck at the, that particular yeah, moment that, or something like fair, that. Fair, fair, fair point. <laughs> but yeah, well, I'm sorry. Yeah, let's let's discuss a little bit. You mentioned that you uh, work for a while for Divine, and one of the big mm -hmm. bits of news in the last couple of weeks, um, I've reported on in the Chocolate Wire um, in my weekly news brief, is that there was not a change of ownership, but a change of ownership structure um, in Divine. Mm -hmm. So one of the yeah. things that many people may not know about Divine is that the impetus for creating the company came from a Ghanaian cocoa cooperative, Kuapakoku. And mm -hmm. what they wanted to do was to find a way to get value added for the cocoa that they were producing. And they did that uh, by starting a business in the UK, Divine, 
And many people don't know that you mentioned this German company, Weinrich, um, is mm -hmm. the company that was manufacturing the product for them. And last week, uh, or in the last two weeks, it was announced that Divine UK had sold their uh, interest in the company to Weinrich, making them now the majority shareholder in the company. Whereas uh, yeah. until that point, Coapa Coco uh, was was the uh, major major shareholder. I mean, you, well, the story is a little more interesting than that. If you go back or, originally, uh, it was a an initiative with Anita Roddick from the Body Shop, who was buying uh, cocoa butter for cosmetics, but had no use for the cocoa liquor. Uh, and didn't want it to go to waste and wanted to buy it from a good source. So she went and found uh, some interested people, and that was Twin Trading, uh, at, who, who specialise in helping startups in, in the ethical sector. They did uh, Cafe Direct here in the UK. Uh, so she got some people together, along with Tradecraft and a small faith group, and that was almost the start of fair trade in the UK as that came. Uh, Green and Blacks were the only people doing anything close to, to that with Maya Gold. And so when Anita Roddick... The, so this is the 1990s? 20 I, years ago. 20 years ago. All right. So I, because I know that uh, Green and Blacks was founded in 1991, if I yeah. recall from my yeah. research. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, and when... Green and Black sold to Mondelez. Uh, we, we got uh, a major shift there, and all of a sudden, the whole of Green and Black's range turned fair trade. Uh, so it was only one line previous to that. And then Anita Roddick sold the body shop to L'Oreal. L'Oreal owns 16% of Nestle, or Nestle owns 16% of L'Oreal. That created a problem because the campaigners who have issues with Nestle and baby milk, etc., then said, we're going to boycott Divine because Divine are bound by Nestle. Uh, Anita spotted this and then gave her shares to the cocoa farmer. And that took them from 20% up to 44%. So the farmers became majority shareholders because of Anita Roddick's generosity and wanted to protect them. Uh, and a year later, she unfortunately died. But her husband, Gordon, carried on that legacy and was still buying cocoa butter from them and have lots of chocolate-related products that come from Quapa Cocoa, the 80,000 farmers. Uh, but I suppose the real questions now are, you know, if the, if the shares have been cut in half, I mean, does that mean that the income from the um, shares is also reduced by half? I mean, that could be quite a hit in terms of Absolutely. The, you know, the, the annual budget. Um, but we're also, I mean, one of the concerns that's been raised is what does this do in terms of uh, management oversight? I mean, maybe there are some board positions that are going to be kept and the people of Coopa Coco still have some influence there. They've but got 20% of the board influence. Okay, so... Now, Weinrich is calling the shots. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that may not be a terror. Court, who's the MD of Weinrich, uh, part of his deal when Divine USA started, which sort of went out on its own and then came back into the UK, uh, so that it, it's now Divine UK again, uh, he, to have some of that business, the, the farmers insisted that he bought shares and then gave those shares to the farmers. So he invested in the US business, but also had to give some of that away uh, to the farmers to keep the deal the same. So I guess he was invested into that as well as being the manufacturer. And he took his son out there uh, and came back saying it transformed his son's view to life, so had a, an epiphany moment. So, so I don't know Court very well, but I know these stories from Sophie Tranchell, the MD, that came back report, with glowing reports of how it had changed his life. So 
being someone that I'd like to see good in people rather than bad, then I'm hoping this is a, can be a good thing. Well, I mean, I think that's a really, really interesting um, connection to make because, you know, I made my first trip to Origin in 2003, um, and mm-hmm. I had been writing professionally since 2001, but working professionally since 1998. And until I made yeah. my first trip to Origin, this is Ecuador, um, and of these little farms, you know, two hours by canoe ride, motorized canoe up the Rio Napo, um, until I you know, was there, everything that I had known or thought I knew about cocoa farming was as a result of reading somebody else's impressions of it. And it wasn't until I had this, you know, direct one-on-one experience of, you know, walking two kilometers in from the river on, you know, and being inundated by rain and then walking uphill to finally, it was just the amount of work that was necessary Mm -hmm. to harvest and then open up the pods and then to take them to the post-harvest processing center um, was just eye-opening. Uh, and so I, mm. I do think that um, that experience at Origin uh, is really transformative. And like you say, a, a, a chocolate person who isn't carrying around chocolate with them, my feeling is, is, is until you've been to Origin, you, 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 there's an entire aspect of this whole process that you just can't, you just can't. The first time I visited the first time I visited Ghana, I took 40 kilos of chocolate with me. Uh, and I did my tasting regime to the board of Quapacoco in their board meeting. I visited schools. They introduced me to chefs in hotels, and I did exactly the same process. I, the, the airport said, what's in there? And I said, chocolate. And they said, are you, are you importing chocolate? I said, no. Uh, and I said, it's for school children and blah. And I bought my way through customs uh, with chocolate. When I came back to Heathrow, I brought all my pods and, and beans back. And they said exactly the same. And I gave them some chocolate as I came through. And I've continued to do that for 20 years now. <laughs> well, I have yet to find anybody at U.S. Customs who can be uh, bribed with a gift of chocolate. Um, I've had my moments bringing back beans and fresh pods from, from origin. And yeah. it's always, you know, I don't want to be going through Los Angeles or Miami. I mean, if I've, I'm flying directly into New York, they, they have, I, what is this? Well, this is fresh chocolate. And they'll go, oh, okay. Right. <laughs> but uh, if, if it's an agricultural product in Los Angeles or in Miami, it's just like, like, forget it. Yeah. Now, um, I know that you've been to Ghana on multiple occasions. You've also mm-hmm. been to the island of Principe. Um, yeah, uh, you know, it, which one is more interesting? What do you learn about you know what's different about what's going on in this small island compared with what's going on in Ghana? Uh, well, Principe is a really, really interesting uh, two little islands. It's the second smallest African country, uh, population of less than a quarter of a million people, and I received a, a strange uh, contact on LinkedIn. Somebody saying, would you, would you like a busman's holiday? And I immediately thought it was a prince that wanted to transfer thousands of pounds into my bank account and because they, they thought I was lovely. Uh, so I was slightly suspicious. And then I had a face-to-face Skype and got to meet her. It was a, an English guy, which, which helped for me, giving me reassurance uh, because I then met him in England and we said, OK, uh, And I'd never heard of the Chocolate Islands. I should have done. They used to be of the world's cocoa, uh, Portuguese territory. And Cadbury bought most of his chocolate from them until he realised there was slavery in his supply chain. Uh, Once he did that, he switched his supply, which the lovely romantic stories of Techi Kaka taking cocoa seeds in his pockets... I think is a is a lovely folk story, but I think the reality was Cabri said I need somewhere else to grow cocoa, and Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire are quite close, so I think there was a little more business in there than monks and and smuggling in pockets. He switched all his business overnight, and the cocoa farms in Satome were left to go feral, and when you go round the island now. There are many, many old trees, uh, a melonado, uh, some criollo, some really good cocoa. 
that is on really bad trees now because they're not being uh, tended to. I uh, read a book that I think I mentioned briefly. I'll, I'll show it. This is called The Chocolate Islands by Catherine Higgs. And it chronicles... Well, if what you'll do is you'll send me information about it, what I'll do is I'll put a link yeah, to it absolutely. in the description to the video so people yeah. can find it if they're looking for it. Yeah, because I, I don't like to go anywhere without having some understanding of their journey. Uh, so I took this book, read it, bought an audio version to listen to all the way across on the plane, and it's 14 hours plus an over, a layover in Lisbon. So I'd got plenty of time to get that into my head. And I, the president came to see what I was doing. The country is so small that if you land uh, and you look like me, uh, white and large, then people notice and say, oh, there's a fella there. Uh, and if I go to the fish market in Prince tomorrow, the ladies will shout, Mr. Chocolate, and they'll wave me over because they, they, they now know me. Uh, but the president was asking me questions. He said, where's the best cocoa grown here? And I said, actually, two minutes from where we are now. And he said, how do you know? And I got my little book out and I said, well, there's a map here that tells you the best and most productive cocoa growing regions historically. Uh, and he said, oh. And then he opened it and he said, that's my house. And he found his own house in the, in the book I brought from England. Uh, so I made him a gift of that book uh, and we became friends. He also offered me a passport if if I need if Brexit gets too difficult for us I can I can become uh, uh, a princey or Satome and well if I can get stuck in your suitcase I mean here in the United States I mean I'm <laughs> devastated by the fact that there is an EU ban on Americans traveling to Europe I mean I would be happy to do the traveling and immediately go into two weeks of quarantine um, if I were to be able to have a Portuguese passport so um, just, exactly. Yeah. Just leave or an EU passport. Just leave it, letting you know on the table. Um, so, um, you know, historically, and for the so many people don't know that at the turn of the 20th century, so around 1900 to 1910, yeah, um, Sao Tome and Principe was the largest cocoa producing region in the world, even yeah. though it was these two very very tiny islands. And as you mentioned, Cadbury uh, purchased an enormous amount of his chocolate uh, from there. Um, and abandoned it, as you said, when he realized mm. that there was slavery in the supply chain. I don't know that moving it to other parts of Africa eliminated <laughs> slavery in the supply chain. No. Um, but um, you know, in the last 20 years or so, um, the island has been specifically known for one person, Claudio Corallo, uh, who is very, yeah. very much an uh, iconoclast. Um, he didn't start off in the chocolate business. He's originally- Coffee, coffee. Coffee, coffee. But, but coffee in Zaire. In Zaire. But before that, in Portugal, he was not in the food business at all, as I understand, or as I remember. No? I think he's got a degree in agroforestry, okay. in farming and agroforestry, which is why he went to do coffee. Uh, and then when there was the issues in Zaire and uh, Zimbabwe, he decided, he, he said he, he, the neighboring missionary was eaten. Uh, and then he decided it was time to leave. This uh, is his story. Well, and it's a good so thing he's very, very skinny. Right, he doesn't have yeah. much meat on his bones, so, so he's no. not the first <laughs> choice. Right. But um, Sao Tome is also, or Principe, they're also both known for the coffee that they produce. I mean, is that because Absolutely. Claudio planted it, or it had been there historically? Or do you know? Uh, no, he's planted it. I mean, when the Portuguese came from, left Brazil, they brought everything that was a cash crop to see if it would grow. So they brought rubber, they brought coffee, they brought cocoa, and they just kept putting things in to see what would take uh, because we were friends with them. So the British Navy protected them. So they were almost, they could do whatever they liked on these two islands with the total protection of the British Navy because we'd done the Trafalgar stuff. We were the supreme of the sea. Uh, and we had a trading relationship with Portugal. The Portuguese were fabulous uh, mariners uh, and navigators. So they'd done the Chinese bit. We'd done the other part. So you got these two colonial powers splitting up areas and sharing. Well, you do that there and we won't say anything and we'll do this over here. 
uh, not politically correct, particularly with the issues happening currently. But that um, so I was a little bit uh, guarded with some of my conversations because I was uh, invited by Portuguese people to go and and do some work on chocolate, and I had read all my, all my stuff and I was pointing out some of the things that that maybe weren't great but there's some good things being done i hasten to add uh the, well i think the... i think you'll find that almost everywhere in the world i mean that yeah we we can point to things that we think can be done better but if you mm. look more closely there's also things that that are um really really quite commendable and you know christy and christy leslie and i were talking about this on our recent interview and one of the things that she mentioned is that there is a tendency to devalue um, local expertise and experience. I mean, if you actually go mm. talk to some of these people who've been working in cocoa for hundreds of years, they're actually extremely sophisticated. I mean, their approach is mm. going to be different, perhaps, from us Westerners or Northerners. Um, but it's a mistake to uh, devalue um, their lived experience on their farms with what it is that they're doing. Well, I, I guess it depends, certainly from the direction I was seeing, that colonialism trains people to do one job and only one part of the process. So they almost for, forbid them from doing the next stage and seeing the whole process. So women were only allowed to weed because that's all they were good at doing. Uh, which meant backbreaking work doubled over, uh, and so when you then had a conversation to the guy who harvested about weeds and and mold, and, and he didn't know anything about that because it wasn't his job; it was a woman's job. Uh, so, and there's also the uh, the mindset that I found in Haiti also, where they wouldn't teach each other to do things because you may take my job if I teach you how to do that. So that the the knowledge transfer was really difficult, uh, and you know what I did is you know in my conversation with Christy, we were talking about Ghana, number one, and my experience in Peru, and shortly that after shortly after that part of the conversation, you know I made the made the point that you, you can't assume that what you know about any one country in their cocoa culture. Uh, is going to track to any other country, uh, and this is this is the perfect example of that. It's just that yeah, you know, the culture here is very very different from other places, and mm. you can get really lost really really quickly if you make some mm. assumptions based on other places yeah. you've been. And and, and I, I observed the trees looked really sparse, uh, and I thought that you know, and I said trees don't look very healthy, and they were really offended. Uh, and I said, oh, and they said, no, wrong time of year. You've, you've, you, you know, it's not, it's not the main season. Uh, you know, and I thought, well, there looks to be lots of mouldy, mouldy pods on there. So I then went to Claudio's plantation because I went and met all the other people, and his trees were fabulous and they were abundant and large and full and healthy. So I took a picture of that tree, then came back to the uh, the MD of the project. I was involved with and said this is your tree and this is his tree and they were both taken today uh and he said okay we've got a problem i said great i think i know a, a potential solution but you know what we've got to start with is there's an issue here and people had because he wasn't a cocoa expert he wasn't uh realizing that there was an issue because people had said oh it's just and People do that all over. People, people do, did that in my kitchen. Then he said, oh, you know, it's like this, chef. So no, it's not. <laughs> well, speaking about, speaking about the kitchen, um, you sent me an image, and I used that image for the title card for this video. Mm -hmm. And you said uh, you're in an outdoor kitchen, a fire, right? You're cooking over wood fire. It, um, it was a lorry, a lorry wheel turned, so a wagon wheel turned upside down with charcoal in it uh, and, we and were cooking. you're making a ganache using locally harvested ilang ilang yeah exactly uh, and this was the first uh, lesson for the ladies to say you know we, we can make ganache 
almost any any way. But I ha had to earn their respect first. They invited me to a buffet, which was a buffet where me and the other uh, Portuguese people had to bring the meat, the protein part, because they, they're poor and they don't have lots of money to spend on protein. Uh, so that was our job. But what they did was the salads and they brought some bread and the bread was a little bit stale and they were quite embarrassed that it was stale and they apologised. And I said, that's fine. Have you got a tablecloth? And said, yeah. And they brought us and bring it. They brought me a tablecloth. I put the bread in the centre of it, sprinkled it with water, tied it up and then put it inside a dry pan on the stove. The water evaporated, made the bread taste fresh like, like you would. And you would have thought I was, uh, you know, uh, a, a Vegas magician. Uh, well, the, 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 the second coming of Gordon Ramsay anyway, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and every, every weekend I went back to cook with the ladies and we did different dishes. They showed me how to cook some of their local dishes. There's another picture on, on one of my blogs because uh, they eat land crab. Uh, and there's a, there's a picture of that uh, cooking up. But four families share this outdoor kitchen and then they're living in what was slave accommodation, like terraced uh, sheds. They're just wooden outbuildings and they're one room and there'll be a family of six or seven living in that one room. Uh, which they took us in and showed us quite happily. But the guy who invited me to Satome, uh, he's called Mark Shuttleworth. And Mark Shuttleworth is a really, really interesting billionaire. Uh, he's dual nationality, uh, Isle of Man here in the UK and South Africa. And he was the second space tourist and went to the Russian Mir station, paid $20 million for the privilege. Uh, and the, the romantic story that I'm not sure how true it is, is that he looked out of the capsule window and I saw these that. two little dots. So, yeah, it's a great Hello. story. So I'm sticking right. with it. Right. Well, uh, I, I happen to know part of this story. I mean, so Mark Shuttleworth, for people who are in the technology industry, uh, would know that he made his billions through a company called Ubuntu or companies called Ubuntu and Canonical. And one of the mm -hmm. things that he's done is he's invested a large part of that fortune on these two islands, South Tome and Principe, in the hospitality. Absolutely. Industry. And, um, yeah. you know, interestingly, most of the land in these two islands is considered world heritage and can't be built yeah. on. But Mark has purchased a couple of thousand hectares of land and is mm -hmm. actively working on producing, um, uh, actually upgrading the cacao that's being produced there as well as uh, looking into doing value-added products on the island. It's really, really an interesting he's, um, example. He's got a recycling project. Yeah. He, brought, he brought every family on the island a wheelie bin to recycle with. Uh, because when you go to Origin, you'll have seen the pervasiveness of plastic, etc. Uh, he extended the runway at the airport, not so it would take jumbos, but just so it could uh, take supplies in. He's helped build three roads. He employs 40% of the total population of both countries, uh, which is uh, an amazing number. Uh, and, and the store, he recently chartered a plane full of PPE equipment and gave every family the, the PPE equipment. He then trained his hotel staff at one of the hotels in basic medic, medical care and created an isolation hospital in case it was needed. Uh, so they've got a five-star isolation hospital. Well, you know, it, it just shows um, how much impact an individual can have um, if they take the care and the interest. I mean, you know, one of the one of the challenges I think that we face right now is that um, is one of scale. If we're actually going to affect change in countries like Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of farmers. And it really is going to require that the largest um, chocolate companies and cocoa processors get actively involved, um, and not just in a way that does greenwashing. Um, it is, mm. you know, really, they're going to have to take responsibility for what's going on. But, you know, people like Sean Eskinozzi at Eskinozzi Chocolate, people like Mott Green at the Grenada Chocolate Company, I know with it what Mark Shuttleworth is trying to do. It just shows 
um, that is possible yeah. to be able to uh, make huge change in people's lives um, if that's how you want to um, direct your attention. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mark, Mark is working with the governments, trying to make sure that it's not just him, because that otherwise it, you know, it becomes his island and not their island. So he's he's very, he appears to be very careful uh, in the joint projects rather than uh, the white the white savior running through and, and doing all this stuff. Well, I mean, and that's another point, another important point too, is that uh, you and I have discussed over the last couple of days uh, online. Um, is that um, you know, one of the challenges with international aid um, is that it comes with a set of assumptions and a set of values. And what you do is you look at the culture through your values and your assumptions, and you end up you know, trying to impose things that nobody wants. And when you leave, mm -hmm. you know, all the work that's done it goes back. It's just gets, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know I, you know, I can't tell you the number of times I've been in South America and seen, you know, expensive equipment that's just literally out in a field rusting, right? And because, yeah. you know, it was donated by some aid agency, but it didn't meet any need that anybody had. So yeah. it, it really is quite sad in that respect. Um, what are, you know, speaking of which, uh, one of the conversations we had um, was there was a recent survey that was done about ethical sourcing practices at major uh, supermarket chains around the world, uh, or yeah. at least in Europe, UK, and the United States. And it showed like Tesco, right, as the number one highest scoring <laughs> um, supermarket chain when it came to ethical sourcing. I mean, sourcing, I mean, it's above Sainsbury's, above, above Whole Foods even. I thought, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought that was really remarkable. Um, I mean, you you worked with Tesco at some level. Um, you didn't seem quite as surprised as I was that Tesco still scored as highly. Well, it's the sheer volumes. If you take the if you're doing the calculation on volume, they're the largest retailer here. So you would only have to switch two or three products to make that impact. Uh, and I guess that. It's Oxfam that did the the research, and they weren't checking. wasn't fair trade, so it would be UTS, it would be Rainforest Alliance, it would be all those accreditations in that mix, and some of those are more rigorous than others. Uh, if I could be as polite as that, really, uh, we, so... we don't stand on being politically correct here. <laughs> I mean, you know, so, well, you know, it's like we're going to call. You know, these are all opinions. Right. And so, mm -hmm. True. You know, yeah, yeah. I mean, although U.S. laws regarding libel and slander are very different from U.K. laws uh, regarding mm -hmm. libel and slander. But I think that opinions uh, about this. Um, so yeah, yeah. I think it makes sense to be able to name things. I mean, again, uh, name companies. One of the conversations we had earlier today online um, was about um, the about shelter.org, which is a big U.K. Yes. charity. Um, but if you look at the emergency chocolate bars that they're selling, um, what you do is you find that they're charging a lot for them, like five and ten pounds a bar. At least that's what it yeah. looks like from the label. And that profits go towards helping shelters around the country. Homeless. But, yeah, yeah. The homeless. Shelter. But the chocolate itself is manufactured by one of the four largest processors in the world. And there's just no way that I think that anybody has really thought about you know, what, you know, are there any ethical breaches in the supply chain anywhere or the people at shelter.org hasn't really, haven't really thought that through. And are they sort of tainted by association because they're not selling something which is sustainably produced or ethically produced or something like that. They're, they're probably paying 30 P per bar for that product that's been sold at five pounds. So that's so that, that 30 P level. bar. Is it like a 50 gram bar or is it? No, no, it'll be a hundred gram bar for that. They're paying uh, thirty pence for a hundred gram bar if, well, of finished chocolate. Wow! I could, I can go, I can go to Tesco's now and buy a hundred gram bar of their value range for thirty p. That isn't compound; it's real chocolate, thirty p. And my phrase to people is: we can't send a letter to the next town for thirty p. So why do we think we can have a chocolate bar that's travelled halfway around the world 
of its journey uh, for 30p and then expect everybody's been paid fairly. And that's what, the difficulty. What, what, is the, what is the response that you get from people when you well, ask them that Everybody question? said that. Well, they say absolutely it can't be right. So the maths don't work. Mm -hmm. You know, I, working in manufacturing, I know the box and the leaflet and the, and the wrapper and then someone's got to put it on a truck and somebody's then got to take it off the truck and put it on a shelf. Those maths don't work at 30p. You know, the, and, the the retail, and the retailer is making most of that, whatever, whatever margin Absolutely. there is, the retailer is making most of it. But well, we, 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 aimed, we aimed to give them 32%. So that was our uh, aim when we were talking to people. Sometimes we made more, sometimes less, but... But this is, when you were working our at, ideal. this is when you were working at Divine? Well, I, well in confectionery, because I've worked for okay. Chupa Chups as well, so I've done other confectionery companies. Right, but even, but even then, so it's an interesting question. I think this is where we're going to end the conversation today, and you know, hopefully um, we can get together again at some time and, and, and go off in different directions. But people, I think, have sort of um, some understanding that the chocolate that they purchase at these low, low prices, um, there's something wrong somewhere, right? And you can tell them that it's, you know, there might be child slavery involved with it. Uh, there might, it might not be sustainably produced and it is uh, contributing to the rapid deforestation of the region in Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana and other places where the cocoa is sourced. Um, but that doesn't get them to change their buying habits, right? No. What's it gonna take? Uh, do you have any? Do you have any? I don't have. I don't have an answer to that question. I don't know what's. Well, I, I I talk to groups a lot, so I do uh, many many. Uh, I'm doing a literary festival in uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, and if I'd have done that physically, because it's going to be online now, there would have been a couple of thousand people in the audience listening to me, and I would always have a an ethical question in there and say, "This is the reality." And this is why most people think that cheap chocolate uh, tastes the same as every other piece of chocolate, because most purchasing habits are they will buy a bar of chocolate, they will open it and eat it or cook with it. And then next week when they go shopping, they'll buy another bar. So they don't have anything to compare it with. When I'm, uh, and, and you were doing tastings, I'll give them a range of four or five some might be different percentages, some may be different origins, uh, some may be different makers, so they can contrast and compare. And I always include uh, a value offer at the end, and you'll see people pull a face and say, that's not very good. And I say, well, that's the one, and that's why that tastes like that, really. You can't pay 30p and get this. Uh, and once people have that experience themselves, they understand. And when you tell them, do you really want to, do you think it's fair? I, I do an exercise with children where I break a bar of chocolate up in the percentages that industry breaks the profits up in. And then children say, that's not fair. I say, no, but when you buy that cheap bar, that's how you're doing it. And, and they understand that way. And, and grown ups are not really different. Uh, you just need to be slightly more sophisticated, but the story is the same. Right, and, and this is something that we talked about in a video conference call last week or the week before, we, yeah. um, that um, um, one of the things that I think resonates with people is that, yeah, slavery is something that happens to other people far away and in, in, in countries where I can't imagine it. And I've never personally experienced slavery, so I don't know what you know, having, you know, being treated that way is. So it's a little harder for me to empathize um, with that. Uh, but we all understand the concept of being hmm. treated fairly. And yeah, absolutely. Um, changing the conversation to, you know, is this the way you want to be treated? I mean, if you yeah. work for your employer and your employer did X and Y and Z and you went, you know, uh, you know, 
you know, this is not fair. You know, fortunately, we live in societies where it's possible for us to um, well, make, the, the, make changes. The but many cocoa farmers, you know, they're not really in a position to do anything else. Exactly. Well, the, my son was a professional rugby league player for a while. Uh, and when he was at university, he played for Scotland. Uh, and so when he did that, and he went to Australia, etc. And there's a competition here, the, the, the national competition, which includes every team. So even the amateur teams and the youth teams can enter this competition and so play like the, the professionals. Cup, like the FA Cup. Absolutely. And his team... Uh, got through to play Halifax, who were a full-time professional side. Uh, the rules and the linesman and the referee and the equipment uh, and the number of players were all set and they were all exactly the same. But we'd got one team of 18-year-old boys, well, there were 20, uh, and one team of seasoned men who trained every single day with medical staff and backup. Uh, and they lost nearly 50 points to 10, I think. So they were well and soundly beaten. But that wasn't fair under any rules. And the trade rules are the same because we've put these disadvantages, whether it's distribution, whether it's cost of getting to market and all those other things, that means it's not fair. So sometimes we do need to level up the playing field like in horse racing, they would handicap to to allow for those things. And maybe that's what some of these systems... I read your notes the other day and, and didn't disagree with any of your suggestions when you said you can't criticise without offering some solutions or potential solutions. Uh, and yeah, I think fair trade, for me, was the best we had. But nothing's perfect and there's things to change. And once people settle in you think oh yeah that maybe wasn't right and maybe what about this and i think we're at 20 years on we're absolutely past that stage and we should be doing other stuff uh so i think that one of the things that has happened and is that institutionalized fair trade so fairtrade.net flo international has reached a point i mean this includes rainforest alliance has reached a point where it's not cool to question it. Um, that it has gained a sort of prestige that means um, it is not subject to the same rules of criticism that other things are. And I think that's wrong. I mean, I made the point in the article that you referenced, which is on the chocolate life about who decides what's fair, is that one way to frame um, fair trade is it's socially acceptable economic imperialism because it's imposing yeah. a set of values that you know, we think of um, that are important to hear to us in the United States and the UK and Europe, but are foreign to the people in places like Ghana and the Ivory Coast. And we're getting them to pay for the privilege of accepting them. They're paying for the certification mm -hmm. fees. And then you know, we, yeah. we're not accepting the market risk and the, the farmers have to accept all the yeah. market risk. And that's, that's fundamentally yeah. wrong, but it's yeah. really hard to get people to accept any sort of criticism that mm. this, these schemes are anything short of perfect outside of, you know, the child labor issues. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, this evening on our news, the Nestle uh, dropping Kit Kat was on and there was fair trade campaigners and Nestle have agreed to meet them. Uh, but I worry how much knowledge these the very well-meaning person will have. Well, but, but when many of the people, what many people don't understand about that is that Nestle is going to be sourcing the cocoa through their own cocoa plan. Yeah, absolutely. Right? And the, the cocoa plan is something that they're paying for, right? And so they're yeah. providing all of this support for the farmers and all this training for the farmers, right? And what happens is, is that, I mean, you need to look closely to find out is the farmer um, as well off or better off under the Nestle cocoa plan than they are under fair trade. But what happens is essentially is that fair trade is angry that, you know, they're losing a buyer, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the cocoa farmer loses anything in the transaction. It's really about, you know, sour grapes that fair trade. Well, well, the, 
Well, they don't. They they do. They do because part of this is going to go to uh, Rainforest Alliance, and that's an arbitrary figure. So the fair trade figure was a, a set percentage. So for someone like, uh, well, if, if you and I decided to to do that, it would probably cost us two percent of our net sales to to Fair Trade Foundation UK. Uh, whereas if you do UTS, you choose it's an arbitrary figure, and it's you know it's not two hundred and fifty dollars. Sorry, two thousand five hundred uh, for a ton, a ton of cocoa. It's you know thirty four dollars something like that. I was reading, so it, it's a very different figure. Uh, oh, you're, you you're choose... talking about you're talking about the premium. Yeah, 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 yeah. The premium. So uh, this is, so, so so this is this is the nuance in the analysis which is missing. Yeah. To the general public, nobody is really talking yeah. about what this actually means for the farmers. They're, 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 yeah. That's entirely lost in the discussion yeah. Yeah. of what it is that's going on. But it's also really important to know for people that when fair trade pays the premium, right? So they're not paying it; the buyer pays it, and the buyer pays it to the cooperative, not to the farmer. And the cooperative determines. Well, the, well there's, there's there's two because the the. The, the premium goes straight to the farmer. So it goes into the cooperative and their pass book is marked. And at the end of the year, they're paid their premium. Certainly the Quapa version, because that's the one I know yeah, well, that, more that's, intimately. That's, a, that's very, very different. So Coapa has got a set of rules. But the, yeah. the fair trade um, position is that the cooperative is 100% autonomy, 100% control over how they use the money. So if they decide to use the money to build a fermentary, right, or improve their drying infrastructure, then that is deducted from the premium before it gets distributed to the farmers. So well, need... they vote. So in in Quapa, they will they have right. meetings. Right. They vote how to spend it, uh, and, but a percentage right. has to right. go on village life. Right. Uh, but the one of the years they insist. But the messaging from Fair Trade is that they directly impact the yeah. farmer and that's and th that's no, not no. necessarily it's a lot more nuanced than that and another yeah, thing yeah, is absolutely that, it's another thing is that the premium is only paid on cocoa that is sold on fair trade terms oh, absolutely yeah, yeah so if i produce 100 tons of cocoa but only sell 40 but, but tons I have... right the other 60 tons i get market and i don't get the premium on it but I, but I have the same issue with with some of our friends in fine cocoa, who say we pay above the market price. That's because they buy the, the buy the very best cocoa that's available. So, and then they disregard the rest of the crop. Uh, and I'm not sure that I would feel proud if I had to go and buy someone else's castoffs. <laughs> it wasn't good enough for you, so can I have it, please? Well, one of the ways that I think about it is I don't like the word fine. I don't like using the word fine because there's an implicit um, presentation that the work of 95% of the farmers in the world is beneath our attention because they're not growing either a Criollo or, or a Trinitario bean. They're growing Foresteros. Yeah. It's not fine cocoa. I don't care about them. And, you know, I, I, you know, I don't know that it's racist um, to make that claim. It's certainly classist. Um, and it has a really significant impact on the way people think about um, cocoa and chocolate. And I think it's negative to make that claim. Mm. I don't like I don't like using the word fine at all. Yeah, I, I think there's some really, really brilliant cocoa. Uh, I was going to say fine then, but some really good cocoa coming out of Forestero from from Africa, from Cote d'Ivoire, because the processing makes just as and if not more impact on the way you deal with that product uh and until 20 years ago i could go to hull docks here which is twinned with kamazi because that's where most of the uk chocolate came in for york and you would see huge piles of cocoa with mold on top of them it looked almost like there was snow or frost on them uh in august and they were just piled up there waiting to be called off to the chocolate factories 
and they'd be blended and no one knew the difference. And by the time you'd added vanilla and all the other things, you couldn't tell that the beans were foisty. And so I think that the whole world has been eating chocolate that maybe we wouldn't consider uh, right. It doesn't happen now because I do work in Holland, see that quite frequently, but it did. And it's in my lifetime I've seen that. I'm not very old. Uh, so I think, you know, as, right. as chefs and chocolatiers... But all, that, but, all that, but all that cocoa and chocolate is keeping you young, right, David? Right. That's what it is. It's the cocoa butter. <laughs> but so, yes, I think there's... Uh, the, the kryptonite for bad flavour is, is vanilla, isn't it? Well, the, well, the kryptonite for bad flavour is artificial vanilla. Yeah. Right? Because then yeah. you're doing things. But yeah, I mean, you know, we're talking about the difference between industrial products and the hallmark of industrial product is consistency. And that's what separates mm -hmm. industrial products from artisan or craft products, because the artisan yeah. or craft producer doesn't really care about consistency. Um, you know, they care about making something which is unique and as a, a unique artistic expression. Um, but certainly, you know, if I take beans from a couple of different origins and I roast them and I blend them together and I get them as close as I possibly can and all the differences, you know, I, I hide by throwing vanilla on the top of things. I mean, it's certainly the way it's done. And certainly you can tell the difference. I mean, a very cheap chocolate, if you put your nose in it, the first mm -hmm. thing you will detect is vanilla. And if you detect yeah. vanilla, you know it's, it's a cheap product. Absolutely. Yeah, so... And is that fair? No, that's not the right question to be asking uh, right now. Uh, but David, we're coming up on an hour, and I want to thank you okay. very, very much for your time. I know um, you're at a five-hour time difference, so it's getting late. Yeah, in the it's 10, 10 p.m. now. Right, and I noticed that um, the internet is uh, getting a little tired um, in your part of the world <laughs> because um, it, you know, there's a little bit of uh, pixelation in the video. So we're going to let it go to sleep, and hopefully it will have rested up and be better. I think that's the way it works, right? Is that the way it works? I think, yeah, I'm sure that's what it is. I'm sure that's the way it works. So it's been a pleasure to talk with you. I'm, I'm sad that we won't be able to meet this year um, in London at the Chocolate Show, but I hope that travel opens up and we'll get a chance to see each other uh, in, um, in person soon, not just do it virtually. Uh, I wish you well. Mm -hmm. Please stay safe. And don't hang up because I'm going to stop the recording, and uh, I'll get back to you offline. But until then, it's been Clay Gordon in New York, David Greenwood Haig in the UK for the chalkboard. So what I want to do is I want to introduce myself. I'm going to say good afternoon, everyone. So no, let's do this. I'm going to say, can you hear the thunder in the background? Yeah, okay, you've got that as well. Yeah, we're, yeah. We're, about to, we're about to start storming here.